So now that we've finished the successful assassinations, we will begin the assassinations that resulted in the president just being wounded, but having survived. Now, the first president who was wounded and survived is actually my favorite president of all time. That is Theodore Roosevelt. Now, Teddy's a very strange case when it comes to presidential assassinations, mainly because he was no longer the president of the United States. Roosevelt had stepped down in 1909, following what at this point became a tradition of only sitting two terms. It would actually be under his cousin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, that discussions for term limits would begin because of uh, FDR dying in office and people no longer wanting to have to deal with the uh, chain of succession anymore. But Teddy's term was extremely progressive. He had taken the Republican Party away from the millionaires class. Teddy begun the policy of trust busting, which was the program of breaking up the monopolies. My apologies. Famously, Roosevelt was the man who took on great tycoons such as John Rockefeller or the Monopoly man himself, J.P. Morgan. So people were actually very upset when he stepped down. But he had handed the leadership of the Republican Party to his close friend, William Howard Taft, who would win the election of 1908. Now, for the first few years, Teddy wasn't actually aware of what was going on in the United States. He had done what become somewhat of a, a popular presidential tradition. He traveled the world. But unlike other presidents who would go to Europe, meet the nobility or Asia, and meet the emperors of the Asian nations, Teddy decided he was a person who was adventurous. He decided he wanted to go to Africa. So he visited Europe on the way back, and it was there he began to discover what was happening in the United States. Taft had been slowly referring back to the old Republican Party style of backing, of backing and protecting big business. This infuriated Teddy, who, when he returned to the United States, actually confronted Taft, who would actually dismiss uh, Roosevelt over his reservations. The reality was the only reason Taft won the election was off Teddy's coattails and popularity. Teddy, when he assumed office after the death of William McKinley, was extremely young compared to other presidents at the time. In fact, even to this day, Theodore Roosevelt is the youngest person to hold the office of president at 42. Not only was he young, he started to take the Republican Party away from the rich man's party had become. Roosevelt was very opposed to giant corporations and the abuses they subjugated on their employees. But now that takes us to our would-be assassin, John Fleming Schrank. Schrank was a Bavarian immigrant. He had come to the United States at the age of nine, so he actually lived in America longer than Bavaria. He had moved to New York, but both his parents died when he was young, forcing him to work for his uncle, who was a tavern proprietor. He had been thrown into a depression later in his life when his aunt and uncle suddenly died. But that wasn't all. His only love interest, Emily Ziegler, died in an accident on a steam wheeler called the General Slocum. Hashtag Gettysburg videos. He became a biblical drifter who wandered the East Coast for some time. Now, much like our other assassins, there is no, no clear reason behind why he did it. Similar to, uh, I would say, probably Oswald. But again, we really don't know what was going on in Oswald's head. Now, he'd become extremely religious, as we discussed, so it's believed that he was opposed to Roosevelt and his progressivism at the time, which is not the same as our modern progressivism. But Roosevelt had decided he would run as a third-party candidate, the Bull Moose Party. This would go on to, to actually ruin the Republicans' he hegemony they had been enjoying, because with the party divided, the Democratic candidate was the New Jersey governor, Woodrow Wilson. A man I have my own opinions of, but that's not for today. But Shrank was also radicalized by the idea that the ghost of William McKinley had come to him at night and convinced him to avenge him by pointing out a picture of Roosevelt. Like much of our other suspects in the series, clearly, as my dad would say, he wasn't all there. Shrank had actually been stalking Teddy uh, during his campaigns for months. 
So it was impressive that he never made a shot, because Teddy enjoyed being a man of the people. Even though he had grown up the heir to the Roosevelts of New York's fortune, he had grown up very mod modestly due to his southern mother, Martha, who grew up in Georgia. So when he was growing up, he enjoyed working with frontiersmen, city workers, and all levels of American civilization. In fact, he would walk beats when he was named commissioner of the New York City Police, which is another little connection for those of you that follow my channel. He also, while serving the U.S. Cavalry, founded a regiment of his own, commanded by his friend L L Leonard Wood. The regiment was made up of all sorts of people that Teddy, throughout his life, had become friends with. But back on the attempt. It's shocking to believe Shrank didn't make an attempt even sooner, but a madman thinks a madman as a madman will. However, finally, on October 14th, 1912, a few weeks from the election, Teddy was visiting Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Now, the day started pretty averagely. Teddy woke up and had a schedule to review. Wisconsin was an important state for his re-election, so that's why he, what had brought him there that day. He had breakfast, then prepared to travel to his next engagement. He had been preparing to give a speech later that day at the Milwaukee Auditorium. The speech was titled, Progressive Cause Greater Than Any Individual. Again, Teddy was a reformist and a trust buster. He wanted to elevate the middle class and stop the top wealthy from abusing them. So after eating breakfast at the Gilpatrick Hotel, he made his way t to the auditorium. While getting ready in the classic Teddy fashion, he stood up in the car waving to the crowds before it pulled off. Again, he was an extremely popular person, so this was to be expected. But from the crowd, Shrank ran forward with a Colt revolver. There's a debate on if it was a police revolver, an army service revolver, but that doesn't really matter. All that matters is that the president was shot. Albert E. Martin, one of Roosevelt's aides, jumped forward tackling Shank. A few more men and police officers ran forward to subdue him as well. But another of Roosevelt's aides was shocked. Henry Cochum looked at Roosevelt, who had simply flinched when he was shot. He said, Are you okay? Roosevelt nodded. He pinked me, Harry. People once seeing Shank subdued demanded he be killed and hung on the spot. But Roosevelt yelled, don't hurt him, bring him to me, I want to see him. People were shocked. Teddy was not only alive, but clearly standing and smiling. He grabbed Shank's head to observe if he knew him, then asked, what did you do it for? Shank remained silent. Teddy shook his head. Oh, what's the point? Turn him over to the police. You poor creature. Officers, take charge of him and see that there is no violence done to him. Shrink was brought into the hotel under custody and Teddy went back on his way to cheer in crowds. Now, from what we have heard this far, we may think, oh, he missed. Or, oh, it ricocheted and didn't actually hit him. Actually, though, it had hit him. But his large coat, his 50-page speech rolled up, and his metal eyeglass case had slowed the bullet so much that once it did hit him, but it had only slightly entered his chest. Roosevelt being, as I said in earlier, Teddy had quite a life, among all people, and he had learned a few tricks in his lifetime. So after he was shot, he was still for a moment and waited to taste blood in his mouth. When he didn't taste it, he realized it wasn't a serious wound, so he went back to his day. So upon arriving to the Milwaukee Auditorium to crowds, he smiled and said, Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know whether you fully understand that I have just been shot, but it takes more than that to kill a bull moose. He would go on to give an 84 minute long speech with a bullet still in his chest. The entire time though, blood was slowly seeping through his chest onto his shirt. Lucky for him, he was wearing a vest that was hiding the leaking. After the speech, Roosevelt then immediately went to a hospital. Now, unlike his predecessor, William McKinley, Roosevelt had an extremely well-done x-ray done. The bullet was discovered, and it was resting close to his pleura. But it had not breached anything. This was because Teddy had so much muscle buildup that it actually also aided in stopping the bullet. 
The doctors deemed it would be more dangerous to remove the bullet than it was to leave the bullet in. So Teddy just shrugged it off. Both Wilson and Taft would suspend their campaigns right after the attempt, out of respect until Teddy recovered. But as I said earlier, Wilson would win. Many people would blame the division of the Republican Party on the loss. Roosevelt would finally retire from public life and go on another adventure, this time to South America, where he'd be for over a year. Roosevelt would live the, with the bull in his chest until his death, being quoted as saying, I do not mind it any more than if it were in my waistcoat pocket. Now, things were different for Shrank compared to our other assassins. For one, his would-be victim survived, but also his would-be victim confronted him which is the second time an assassin would be confronted, the first being Richard Lawrence, who almost got beaten to death by Andrew Jackson. But more specifically, at trial, Shrank was declared mentally insane, so his plea of insanity was found factual. So after being found guilty by way of insanity, he was committed to the Central State Hospital for the Criminally Insane, where he would remain until his death in 1943. Teddy would go on to live until 1919 and be remembered as one of the United States' best presidents being memorialized on Mount Rushmore. Now, this is our first attempt mon Now, this would be our first wounded attempt. Monday, we will be discussing the next one and last one, which will be that of Ronald Reagan and John Hinckley Jr., who is actually still alive at the time of this video at the age of 67. Thanks for watching, as always. Thanks for joining us for this journey into the darker subjects in U.S. history. If you enjoyed, please like, share, and comment. And if you're a first-time viewer, I invite you to please subscribe. I try to have new content up daily and love the interactions with you all. Thanks again, and see you in the next one.